Good morning and welcome to HFA at Home here on this beautiful Easter morning. We are so glad you joined us today. We're just thrilled that you're here with us. I know it doesn't seem like the Easter's that we've experienced before in our lifetime. We have never had an Easter like this before, but nonetheless, that doesn't change the fact that it is Easter and it is the day that we celebrate our faith. It is the day that we do what we do, why we take the gospel to a hurting and dying world because of this day we have hope. We have hope in what Jesus has done for us. So I don't know about you, but all week long, it didn't feel like Holy Week to me at all. And I'm sure you all experienced the same thing. So I decided I'd refocus and do something to refocus. So, th so this morning I got up and experienced that tradition that I have loved all of my life, sunrise on Easter morning. So as I sat outside in that crisp air and watched that sun come up over the horizon, it just causes something in me every time to just take me back to that day over 2,000 years ago where Jesus rose and defeated the grave. Not only that, just the thought of Mary coming upon that empty tomb and then turning to find herself face to face with her Savior and her Lord. It's just a wonderful thing to think about. And every time I do that, I feel like I'm gonna see him step out on the horizon himself in that sunrise. What a glorious thought, what a glorious time that we have to think about that and to refocus and to know what Easter is all about. You know, because of what he did this on this day, because he rose, not because he died, but because he rose, we have that promise of what He is, has done for us, the promise that He will always defeat death. He will always be able to heal us of our sickness and our disease, even COVID-19. He can defeat that and He will. As Ecclesiastes 1 says, and let me read it to get it right, the sun rises and the sun sets and hastening to its place, it rises again. The sun will always rise on a new day, a new day, no matter what we are going through in our life, no matter what is going on in this world, no matter if COVID-19 seems rampant across our world, that sun will rise again the next day. Just like Jesus rose on that day so long ago, we have that hope. We have that promise of the sun rising and we have the promise that he's given us through him rising on this day so, so long ago. We celebrate today. We celebrate with you and we're so thankful for you. So take heart today, refocus and do what you need to do to think about and, and what this day means, what it means to us, what it means to our faith. Because family, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hey guys, remember last week when we told you that at the end of service today, we're going to do communion together. So if you have forgotten, um, if you'll take a moment real quick and go grab some juice, some crackers, bread, whatever you have on hand, um, we're just going to use those as symbols to take communion together today. It is such a special time and we want to do that with you. So if you don't have it, stop real quick, run, go grab something and, and have it ready for end of service, okay? Hi everyone, if you guys will join us as we worship and praise and glorify the King of King, the risen King, as this is our Easter service. Um, so we're just inviting you guys to come and worship with us this morning. Amen.
praise and all honor and all glory, Father, to you, Lord Jesus, the risen King, the King that could not be held back by a grave, by death, by sickness, by fear. You are the resurrecting King. You are the resurrected King, Lord. There's none like you, Lord. There's none like you, Lord. And we pray, Father, for revival to begin even in the midst of the storm, Lord, that you would stir revival in us, Father. Come alive. Come alive in us, Lord. Come alive in us, Lord, as we're home and we get to have the intimate times with you and worship you and even in our homes as, as a body coming online and through social media, Lord. Come alive in us, Lord. Awaken our spirits. Awaken the church, Lord. We are here for you, to honor you, to praise you, to bring glory to the King of Kings, the risen King. Lord, we love you. We honor you this morning. Father, come and have your way open our ears and our minds to hear the word that you would have for us this morning. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. To town the other day, just me and my daddy. He said I had finally reached that age, and I could ride next to him on a horse that, of course, was not quite as wide. We heard a crowd of people shouting And so we stopped to find out why 
There was a man that my dad said he loved, but today there was fear in his eyes. So I said, Daddy, why are they screaming? Why are the faces of summer and beaming? Why is he dressed in that bright purple robe? I'll bet that crown hurts him more than he shows. Daddy, please, can't you do something? He looks as though he's gonna cry. He said he was stronger than all of those guys. Daddy, please tell me why. Why does everyone want him to die? Later that day, the sky grew cloudy. And Daddy said I should go inside. Somehow he knew that things would get stormy. Boy, was he right. But I cannot keep from wondering if there was something he had to hide. So after he left, I had to find out. I was not afraid of getting rocked. So I followed the crocs to a hill where I knew men had been killed. And I heard a voice come from the cross. And it said, Father, why are they screaming? Why are the faces of some of them beaming? Why are they casting their lots for my robe? This crown of thorns hurts me more than it shows. Father, please, can't you do something? I know you must hear my cry. I thought I could handle a cross of this size. Father, remind me why. Why does everyone want me to die? Oh, and will I understand why? My precious son, I hear them screaming. I'm watching the face of the enemy beaming. But soon I will clothe you in robes of my own. Jesus, this hurts me much more than you know. But this dark hour, I must do nothing. Though I heard your unbearable cry. The power in your blood destroys all of the lies. Soon you'll see past their unmerciful eyes. Look down below, see the child trembling by her father's side. Now I can tell you why. She is why you must die. Hey, good morning to you. Thank you for joining us today. 
Today is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. What a day it is to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We're talking about essentials. The name of our series is The Identity of Christ. And we've taken time over the last few weeks to identify who he was, what he did for us, um, his sinless life, his virgin birth, all of those kind of things that are essentials that we hold to be truths that transform our life. They have changed us. They've made us who we are. Today, we're going to talk about the resurrection. And when you talk about essentials, you've got to include the resurrection. You can't leave it out. Without the resurrection, we can't do uh, anything else. It is so vital to what we believe today. Hey, listen to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 through 19. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if, all, and if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. When you talk about the resurrection, you get all kinds of responses. You get, you get people who mock. You get people who make fun. You get people who are intrigued. You get people who listen intently, weighing all the evidence, but then making their own decision. Delon and I pastored in Fort Stockton, Texas many, many years ago. We were there, and there was a young man who came by the house one day knocking on the door, and he was selling little uh, art things. Um, and what he told us was that he was trying to raise money for a, a student foreign exchange thing that he could exchange place with some Russian student and and study there for a bit. And so I just began to question him. I began to talk to him, began to try to get to the bottom of what he was actually doing. I didn't believe his foreign exchange story. Well, through the course of the discussion, he revealed that he was a part of the Unification Church, which follows Reverend Moon and all of that kind of a deal. And I assured him, I said, well, we're Christians. Uh, we believe Jesus came. We believe he lived. We believe he died. We believe he rose again. And we believe he's coming back again. He looked at me with this look of in, uh, just an incredulous look. And he said, don't tell me you actually believe that someone is going to come flying back through the clouds one day and all of y'all are going to go up to meet him. Well, obviously he knew more about it than he was letting on. I said, I absolutely do believe that. Tell me what's the greater miracle, to believe in Jesus who has died, resurrected, and will come back just like he said, or to believe in a man who said he's going to live forever. Well, he looked at me. At that time, Reverend Moon was still alive. He died in 2012. He went the way of every other man. Jesus died, but he was resurrected. In fact, the resurrection, I'm convinced, is one of the easiest things to prove in all of history. It becomes easy to prove as we, as we look at the story. Uh, the, when, when people respond to you in ways when you're talking about the resurrection, those responses are true in our day, and they were true into the days of Jesus. Look, to what, look at what Luke records about Paul's ministry to the Athenians. In Acts chapter 17, verse 32, he said, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. The reaction to the resurrection is exactly the same then as it is today. Martin Luther, uh, that great father of the Reformation, one of the fathers of the Reformation, said this about the resurrection. He said, the resurrection of the Lord Christ is made certain, number one, by the testimony of his adversaries, 
by the testimony of his friends, by the testimony of the Lord himself, and by the testimony of the dear prophets and the holy scriptures. Martin Luther understood that all of those things proved beyond any shadow of a doubt the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today we're going to look at we're going to look at a couple of things. First of all, we're going to look at some challenges to the resurrection. That's that's point number one. If you're if you're taking notes, the challenges to the resurrection. Last week we talked about the death of Christ, and I recommend if you if you haven't heard that message, you can you can go online and you can watch it or you can listen to it through our podcast, whatever you want to do. I talked about the death of Jesus, and I talked about the swoon theory, just this idea that somehow Jesus fainted on the cross. He didn't really die. Listen, no one came down from the cross alive. Everyone who was crucified on a Roman cross perished. I can assure you of that. Jesus died of his wounds on the affliction. They say that he fainted and uh, was not really dead. But listen to me. The centurion who looked up at him that day recognized that he was dead. He reported to Pilate that he was dead. The soldiers who came to remove the, uh, to break the legs of those who they had crucified recognized that he was dead. They didn't break his legs. Uh, Joseph, who asked for his body, and it was prepared with uh, traditional Jewish burial processes. We know that Jesus died. That's one challenge that we can do, do away with very, very quickly. Then there's another theory called the theft theory that someone literally came in and stole the body of Jesus. Well, we have a couple of suspects. There were two boys who were constantly in trouble. They were constantly uh, getting on. Uh, their parents were constantly having to get onto them because they were continually in trouble. They decided they would take him to the local pastor. So the pastor called one young man in and began to question him. The other young man sat outside the pastor's office. And then uh, as they were switching places, the older boy looked at the younger boy and they go, listen, Jesus is missing and they think we took him. Okay. Okay. So there were those who think that someone stole the body of Jesus. There were those who, who thought that he was, he was stolen. Well, listen, Roman and Jewish authorities could not have been guilty of stealing the body because when the disciples began to preach about the resurrected Lord, they would have, they would have paraded the body up and down the main street of Jerusalem. It didn't matter if it was a Roman authority or a Jewish authority. Both wanted him gone. Both wanted this cult to end, and they would have produced the body uh, immediately to show that he was born. But but they have but they have no proof that he was still in the grave. Well, they say, well, the disciples stole him. The disciples took his body. But listen, the disciples would have broken under such pressure. If you think waterboarding is bad, listen to what the disciples went through and they did not break. It stands to reason that all of them, except for the uh, disciple of disciple John, every other disciple was literally tortured and killed for the fact that they preached the resurrection of Jesus. They were sawn in two. Uh, they were, they had, they had a, 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 a fur sewn to their backs and they were loosed and hunted by dogs. They were speared. They were stabbed. They were tortured. They were boiled in oil. They were, they were literally tortured because of this message of the resurrection of Jesus. Not one of them gave in. Not one of them let out the secret that they had really actually stolen the body of Jesus. So the, the theft theory holds no grounds either. Then there's the projection theory. And it's this that the disciples literally began to believe the story that they made up. That they literally began, well, can I tell you how foolish that is? 
Psychologists tell us today that we can lie with enough passion and regularity about something, we actually begin to believe what we've lied about. Well, I can tell you that wasn't true for the disciples. In fact, we read in Scripture where they actually began, they had trouble with this whole resurrection thing at first. We read about Peter. He knew it was over. He watched Jesus die. He knew it was over. He said, I'm going fishing. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus appeared to two disciples there that were walking home. And he said they were foolish and slow of heart to believe what the prophets had said. He had trouble convincing them who he was. He appeared to them and they had trouble believing it was him. He said, if you touch me, you'll see that ghosts do not have flesh and bone like I do. Feed me. And they witnessed him eating. And finally, they were convinced it was Jesus and he was alive. Thomas is the one we really give the hard time to. He had uh, Jesus had appeared to the disciples and Thomas wasn't there. They began to tell him about it. They began to talk to him about Jesus. He said, I will not believe unless I, unless I put my thumb in his nail prints of his hands and my hand into his side. He said, I, I will not believe. But when Jesus appeared to Thomas and Thomas touched him and Thomas saw him and Thomas knew that he was alive, he fell on his knees and cried, my Lord and my God. There are challenges, no doubt, to the resurrection. But listen, they're foolish when we, when we, when we put them to the test. When we think clearly and, and objectively through them, we can see through every single challenge. So here's the second point today. If you're taking notes, write this down. The changed lives of the disciples proves the resurrection. Paul is talking, or uh, pardon me, Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 2. It was after the Holy Spirit had fallen. They'd spilled out into the street, and there were thousands of people gathered there that day to listen to Peter, Peter uh, preach a message. Peter said this in Acts chapter 2, verse 32. He said, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Jesus appeared to over 500 men and women, walking among them, eating with them, talking to them, sharing the, his, his, the truth of his gospel with them. Over 500 witnesses saw Jesus. So here's what we know about the resurrection. The resurrection confirms the saving power of the cross. Listen to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul said this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Listen, without the resurrection, there would be no need for him to go to the cross. Without the resurrection, there'd be, there'd be no sacrifice he could pay for our sin. Without the resurrection, there'd be no healing for you and I. Without the resurrection, there'd be no hope beyond the grave. Without the resurrection, you and I would be lost in our sins. But thank God, we have a Jesus who is alive today. He's resurrected and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. That means he's literally praying for me and he's praying for you. I don't know about you, but that just excites me. It just excites me to know that Jesus is alive and well. The resurrection liberates us from sin and death. The resurrection gives us victory over the grave. It gives us victory over sin. It gives us victory over those things that have held us in fear all of our life. The resurrection matters today. The, the disciples proved to us that Jesus rose they witnessed him, they saw him, they, they touched him, they felt him, they ate with him, they watched him walk through walls. I mean, he's got a glorified body now. Walls doesn't mean anything to him. He don't have to go through the door. He doesn't have to crawl through a window. He can walk through walls. 
We're going to have a body like that one day. I don't know about you, but I think it's going to be really, really good. I can eat whatever I want, not gain weight. I can live however I want. And the, the resurrected body is going to protect me. The resurrection assures us of justification. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says this, Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. That word justification, it's kind of a big word. I heard an evangelist give this definition of it. One day he said, justification just simply means just as if I had never sinned. That's why Jesus was raised on the third day. So we could be justified. It's just as if we had never sinned. We were never guilty. So we know that Jesus came, he lived, he died, and he rose again the third day. Here's the last point. The resurrection guarantees our resurrection will be possible. His resurrection, he, he's, a, he's, he's the first fruit. He, he was raised from the dead first. There were many that were raised after him. But you and I have this hope now. Of all men, without this hope, we are most miserable. But with this hope that he rose from the dead, you and I can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that we can too. We can conquer death just like he conquered death. Here's the way I heard one man describe death. It is like it's passing from one, from one existence into another. The last moment our eyes are closed in this life, they're opened in a new life. That, that, that hope of resurrection lives within us, gives us a desire to see Jesus. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 8 says this, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. What a glorious hope that is, that one day we're going to live with Jesus forever. We're going to be in the presence of Christ. We're going to be in the presence of the Father. We're going to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit. You and I will one day get to live with Jesus and throughout all of eternity, throughout the end of time. I want to pray for you today. I don't know, you may be questioning this whole thing of Christianity. Maybe you've tuned in the last few weeks and you've been questioning, you've been wondering, you've been, you've been, you've been establishing these facts along with us about the identity of Christ. And now you're, you've realized that it's time to make a decision. It's time for you to make a decision to trust Jesus with your life. It's time for you to make a decision to trust the Lord with your tomorrows, with your future. We have no idea what our future holds, but we know the Lord and we know he's in charge and we know he's in control of our life. Let me pray with you today. Let me pray for you today. Let me just invite you to invite Jesus to come into your heart. Whatever we ask him, he will do. Whatever we, we, we ask him to do, if we ask him to forgive us of our sins, he'll forgive us. If you ask him to come into your heart, he'll come into your heart. He'll be the Lord of your life. Let me pray with you today. Would you just repeat this prayer with me? I realize it's more than a prayer. It's more than just mere words, but it is something from our heart that we communicate to Jesus himself. Can I just encourage you, just say this prayer with me. 
Father, I come humble and broken, ready to be saved, ready to be redeemed, ready to be made whole. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sin. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Take control. Take control of my past. Take control of my today. Take control of my tomorrows. I surrender to them, to you. I give them to you. And I know you're able. Father, I want to pray for everyone who just prayed that prayer with me today. Lord, I, I just celebrate with them. The Bible declares that all of heaven is rejoicing when one person comes to know you. And Father, we celebrate with them. We, we honor them. We, 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 we praise them. Father, I thank you, God, for your great work in our life. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen.
Wasn't that an amazing message? We are so grateful that Jesus is no longer in the grave, that he is risen and at the right hand of the Father. Pastor David brought an amazing word and we're so grateful for him and for Jesus and for all that he's done for us. If you made a commitment and prayed that prayer at the end, we would love to get to know you and to hear about it. If you would go to our website, and click the guest tab. At the very bottom, you can fill in your information and at the bottom, you can let us know whether you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior or whether you rededicated your life to the Lord. We want to celebrate with all of heaven when you make a commitment like that. So we would love to celebrate with you. Also, if you're a first time guest, we wanna to get to know you. So if you would also go to our website and click that guest tab and just let us know that you came and you watched our sermons today and you would like more information. We're so grateful that we get to do life together and uh, we're so grateful for you guys. Happy Easter.